So much for the politics. Back in South Africa, the military plan was well underway. Manon de Toy had recruited and installed 54 men into the 224 Hotel in Pretoria. The sheer number of them drew the attention of the staff. There's all these guys booking in now, you know, it's very strange, a big group just coming in like that. And they just told us, no, it's just guys that they're training to be security officers and they're covering the boat. Some training. Over a four-day period, they went to a remote property at Walkerville on the outskirts of Johannesburg to practice house penetrations and shooting exercises for the coup. Their fee for taking part was to be $3,000 each. Obiang's days appeared to be numbered. But there was a problem. The South African Intelligence Service had been told about the operation. The plan to topple Obiang had become an open secret. An old colleague from the South Africa Special Forces, Johan Smith, knew many of the men involved and was told about the coup. I still have a lot of, of friends and contacts within uh, circles in South Africa, uh, security circles and so on, and uh, I bounced it off them. And they confirmed some of the facts, and I knew that this was quite serious. And it wasn't just Smith that knew. Smith claims he passed it on to the British government twice, to the secret intelligence service, MI6, at least three months before the coup was due to take place. So the UK government at that stage they knew about just the military side? Is that, is that your understanding? No, no, not at all. I think they had to be, uh, well, I know that they had the, the bigger picture. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. In terms of, what do you mean by the bigger but, picture? Uh, for the, well, that uh, both uh, the behind the scenes guys, the actors uh, or the financiers and the tactical level. Really? So you think they, the UK government back in January knew both sides? Yeah. The on the ground yeah. military stuff, yeah. Nick Detoy and the guys. Yeah. Yeah and also the men behind it, the yeah. plotters, yeah. the finance boys. Yeah, that, that is far, as far as I know. But it took the British government nine months to remember that Smith had sent them a detailed memo, even with the mobile phone numbers of those involved. We asked Jack Straw to be interviewed for this programme, but no one was willing to comment on this memory lapse. And the US government had the information too, Smith sent them a detailed memo. What's more, Theresa Whelan from the Pentagon told us that Greg Wales had warned her trouble was brewing in Equatorial Guinea. Whelan told the State Department. The plotters had received a tip off too. Three months before the coup attempt, they knew they'd been rumbled by the South African Intelligence Service. So why did they press ahead? I believe that they believe they had a go signal from somebody. I'm not necessarily saying that the government of South Africa sat down and made a conscious decision, but that somebody in the security services, somebody in the intelligence services was talked to, was made witting to this, and the actors in it walked away from that meeting or that telephone call with a belief that they were going to be able to take a plane load of people out of South Africa, fly to Harare, and from Harare to Malabo, and overthrow a government. They believed that they were going to be able to do that. On March the 7th, the day of the coup, 67 mercenaries boarded this plane to fly to Harare. Here they would meet Simon Mann, load the weapons, and head on to Equatorial Guinea. In Equatorial Guinea, Nick de Toy would be waiting with 15 men to meet them. In the early hours, de Toy and his team would seize the airport's control tower and change the radio frequency so they could guide their plane in. At 2.30 a.m., the Boeing 727 carrying Simon Mann and the other mercenaries was due to land on this runway. As soon as the plane landed, one team would secure the airport. The other teams would jump into cars provided by Nick de Toy and speed off into the capital to see strategic locations. Once the military bases and police headquarters were secure, they tracked down the president and its curtains for the regime. By the time everyone woke in the morning, the coup would be over and Severo Moto, who was being flown in from Spain, would be the new president. But it didn't happen. 
Over 80 men were arrested, 68 of them at Harare Airport. Both Mann and Detoy were flung into two of Africa's worst prisons. They now began paying the price. Amongst those arrested was Neil Stale, the pilot of the aircraft. Neil was an old colleague of Simon Mann's from previous African operations, as was his brother, Johan Stale, who had also been asked to take part in the coup attempt. I was asked right in the beginning of the year, in, in the beginning of January, whether I'd be interested, but uh, I just turned it right down, right from the word go. I was dubious about the fact that it was so well known, and it wasn't a secret at all that something like this was happening. A lot of people knew about it, and it was done pretty much in the public eye, I mean, to take off on a Sunday afternoon out of an airport like Wunderboom. I mean, There's just hundreds and hundreds of people looking at this lot. Yeah. None of this was making sense, especially with Simon Mann's track record. Simon Mann is very good at his chosen profession. That's what's so surprising about the way this plot has unfolded, is that that degree of professional uh, activity is not evidenced here. You don't see it, and there, that's a serious, from my perspective, disconnect in this story as to how an individual like Simon Mann or Nick Detoit all of a sudden are coming across as buffoons when they have no history of having operated in that manner in the past. There's just too many open questions that have to be answered as to what role was being played by the South African government, and more specifically, from my perspective, the South African intelligence services. According to court documents, both Mann and Detoy claim the operation had the approval of the South African government. So had it all been a trap? I went to see Jeremiah Mamabolo, the deputy head of African affairs for the South African government. We are vehemently opposed to such activities, particularly if they are going to be done by people coming out of South Africa. And we'll do our best to make sure that they don't do it here. And uh, if they do, that uh, justice is soon to be done. And that's just what the South Africans did. Armed with the information, they then alerted the Obiang regime. South Africa got to know. Zimbabwean South Africans and the Equatorial Guineans were able to work out that there is a coup being planned somewhere. And as a result, we're able to notify the other side. So um, part of the trap, part of the plan, was to actually give them the weapons so that they had the evidence? Well, I would say yes, because if you wanted to make a case against anybody, you needed to have this evidence of these people actually beginning to pick up this uh, armaments. And to ensure that they knew everything, we've been told by several sources that there were even South African agents on the plane. And as the plot hit the fan, our evidence shows that the phones went mad. From his prison cell in Harare, Simon Mann smuggled out a letter which brought a new twist to the tale. Sounding like a boy's own comic, Mann appeals to a smelly and scratcher. The fragrant smelly is thought to be Ellie Khalil, at this point still smelling of roses, and scratcher, the school nickname for Margaret Thatcher's son, Sir Mark. Man's appeal fell on deaf ears. But the heat on Thatcher had begun. Greg Wales began talking about phone calls to Thatcher threatening him um, from the relatives of the men arrested in Zimbabwe. Uh, I was astounded. I wondered why on earth they should want to threaten Mark Thatcher, um, uh, unless Mark Thatcher was involved, of course. As the evidence mounted, the worst nightmares of those involved began to come true. People turned supergrass. Deals were done. Pilot Krauser Stale helped nail Thatcher. On a plea bargain, Thatcher was fined £265,000 and given a four-year suspended sentence for financing, although he says unwittingly, mercenary activity. Compared to others, Scratcher has got off lightly. Nick Tatoy was sentenced to 34 years in Equatorial Guinea's notorious Black Beach prison. At first, he confessed to everything, but now he's changed his story. 
I met him just days before his sentence was passed. I was approached by Simon Mann with a request to help him, and I refused the request. So yes, I knew that they planned some sort of a thing, but I have got no detail of what they were planning that were done. I was not part of any planning. I was here on a business. It was genuine business. It's been genuine yeah. business. I mean, I had, I had an aircraft here standing on the airport mm. with enough fuel to run away wherever I wanted to go. He alleges that those arrested have been tortured, a claim backed by human rights groups. Every day we were threatened. They told us physically that they will take us three, three at a time and kill us until we, we tell them the story as, we, as they want the story to be heard. Simon Mann went down for seven years in Harare, but has since seen his sentence reduced to four years, perhaps with a deal in the offing. But the story of betrayal isn't over yet. Thatcher has agreed to cooperate with the South African government, so the other men alleged to be involved in the coup might well be beginning to sweat. Smelly Ellie sits nervously in his multi-million pound Chelsea mansion as Scotland Yard's anti-terrorist squad looks into the case. We asked Greg Wales about his involvement. While he maintains to this day that he had no knowing involvement in the coup itself, he is being pursued through the London courts by the Equatorial Guinea government. Severimoto's credibility has been blown and Washington isn't going to be best friends with him now. And South Africa wins all round. South Africa does a favor to Harare, it does a favor to Malabo, it moves against an internal problem of mercenaries. All of that plays to South Africa's benefit. And Obiang rewarded South Africa with a new oil contract. Meanwhile, he's determined to nail the men who plotted his downfall. But if he thought he was safe, he should think again. We've obtained a secret report detailing a sinister plot to assassinate Obiang. It says that in July 2004, a meeting was held in London with former members of the elite Russian Alpha Special Forces Unit. Obiang's death would be made to look like a local job. But for now, one point remains clear. President Obiang better not get too comfy again in the seat of power. There's simply too much oil here and too little in the way of defences for the sharks not to come back. Next Monday at 9pm, we look at the man behind the tan as three investigates Kilroy. Stay with us, though. Little Angels, next. <laughs>